All right, I am gone today, but I wanted to finish our reading that we had for chapter 10. So um, I'm going to start right here. I know we may have read, some of you may, we may have read this already, but we're going to go ahead and read this section and then get to the end of the chapter, and then you'll have a journal entry to do and a chance to work on your vocabulary, okay? So right now we're in the point where they're talking about the fact that holding anyone who has who's a typhoid carrier is pretty much going to be impossible to do. There's so many people out there, they can't find them all. So, um, but the other part of it is, is when they find people who are typhoid carriers, the question becomes, what can they do? If they can't become cooks, how are we going to help them? So I'm going to start right here where it says, because. Because these restrictions might make it hard for some carriers to earn a living, the service suggested a reasonable compensation to help them. A compensation means like a payment. At the, time, New York, at the time, New York City did not pay Mary Malone or any other carriers that they found. So what that means is they basically took Mary Malone, locked her up for three years, didn't pay her anything, and then set her loose and said, good job, have fun, good luck, hope you can find a job. Researchers in Europe and the United States have been working since 1896 on another way to control typhoid, a vaccine. The U.S. Army was eager to try it. In 1909, the Army tested the vaccine on volunteers, showing that it caused no harm. The vaccine didn't give total protection to everyone, but those who later were exposed to typhoid and became sick usually had milder cases. In 1911, all soldiers were vaccinated and the number of cases in the ranks plunged. Doctors began giving the vaccine to civilians who might be exposed because of an epidemic, travel, or a profession such as nursing. So if you take a look right here, this shows a picture of American soldiers getting the typhoid vaccine during World War I. Especially during wartime, they would have wanted to make sure that all soldiers were vaccinated because you have a lot more people who are in, um, you have a lot more people who are together in closed cramped quarters as they're fighting and living and working through the war. All right, outbreak. We've already had an outbreak, but now we're going to have another one. For a while, after her February 1910 release, Mary Malone upheld her end of the agreement with the Board of Health. She checked in as she was required and submitted feces for lab tests. The bacteria hadn't gone away, and she was reminded not to cook for others. Then, in 1913 or 1914, Malone stopped showing up. No one knew where she was or what had happened to her. The mystery worried health officials. Now, one thing right here, it says that she was reminded not to cook for others. But you need to remember, being a cook in her position was actually a much better paying job than anything else that she would have gotten. Stop and think for a second about what we know about Mary, about whether or not she believed she actually had typhoid. And do you think that she's really going to stick with that promise of not cooking for others? All right. In January 1915, the Department of Health received a report of a typhoid fever outbreak at Sloan Hospital for Women, a maternity hospital. A maternity hospital means that's where women would go to have babies, okay? So you have pregnant women, women who have just given birth, and then babies and children at this hospital. Of the 281 patients and employees, 25 of them became ill, including doctors, nurses, other workers, and a patient. A nurse and a chambermaid died. The department knew that this hospital was meticulous or very, very careful about their hygiene. So investigators focused on food as the outbreak source. They uncovered an important clue when they learned that one of the sickened doctors had eaten only a single meal at the hospital. Everyone who developed typhoid had eaten that meal too. Investigators traced the source of the bacteria to a pudding. Coincidentally, the health department had given typhoid vaccines to some of the doctors and nurses during the previous three years. Almost as many of them became sick as those who hadn't been vaccinated. The vaccine apparently didn't protect against a large dose of foodborne bacteria. So they're saying the vaccine is helpful, but in this case, there was so much typhoid bacteria in the food, and because it was delivered to them through food that they would have ingested and put into their body, yep, that's a vocab word, 
um, that means that even though they were vaccinated, they still got sick. And this is a picture of an advertisement. Typhoid carrier, any food not cooked after preparation. In this manner, the famous Typhoid Mary infected a family after family. The missing cook. Investigators zeroed in on the kitchen, sampling the staff's blood. The vital blood test of the cook who had prepared the pudding was slightly positive. But because the test wasn't always reliable, they couldn't be certain that she was the source of the outbreak. Something else made the health inspector suspicious. After they took the cook's blood sample, she suddenly quit her job. Health officials described her as an Irish woman named Mrs. Brown, who had been working there since October 1914. Her co-workers said that when the outbreak started, they had nicknamed her Typhoid Mary. It was all in fun. None of them had reason to suspect the cook of causing the epidemic. In case you haven't figured it out, the author's setting us up right here. The health department made it a priority to find Mrs. Brown. Over the next few weeks, investigators interviewed her acquaintances, trying to learn more about her and what she might be, where she might be. What they discovered was disturbing. The woman they sought was none other than 45-year-old Mary Malone. Someone tipped them off that she might be living in a house in another part of New York City, the Corona section of Queens. The health department put a man on a lookout at the house. On Friday, March 26, 1915, the temperature in New York hovered around the upper 30s. An occasional light rain made it a dreary day to be outside. But the officer watching the Queens house stayed alert and it paid off. He spotted a woman walking down the sidewalk toward the house her face concealed by a veil. Veil. She opened the front door and went inside. The officer immediately called in the sighting and kept an eye on the house to make sure she didn't leave. Soon, several members of the health department, including sanitary inspectors and a doctor, were rushing by car to the scene. After they all arrived, one of them rang the doorbell. No one answered. Knowing that the woman was still inside, an officer extended a ladder to a second floor window and climbed up. When he raised the window, a bulldog and a fox terrier greeted him with threatening barks. He tossed some meat to the dogs and they let the health inspector crawl inside. As the men searched for the woman, they heard doors shutting. Someone was definitely in the house. Finally, they came to a closed bathroom door. One of the inspectors pushed it open. A middle-aged woman was huddled in a corner. It was Mary Malone. They had her again. All right, so we just finished up. This is the end of Chapter 10. Um, I am going to, once you finish with this, you need to make sure you go in and you complete your Fatal Fever Journal, and then make sure you're listening for directions from the guest teacher.